thank you so much. I thank you for this time we have together, Lord. I thank you for the praise reports. I thank you for what I believe, and I just things that you're going to be doing, ways that you're going to be moving. I, I believe that you're going to be moving more and more among your people with the days that are coming ahead because you, you want to bring yourself more and more glory and more and more people come to saving grace of who you are and what you're all about. We thank you for that. Lord, I just pray that uh, through the presence of your Holy Spirit, you will explode in our hearts tonight when we get ready to read your holy word. And I just pray a fresh anointing upon me that I can teach it in such a way that will please you and honor you. In the name above all names, I pray. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're making our way through John chapter 13. I want to go ahead. I think we went through, uh, I think we did the first 17 verses, I believe. But I want to do our normal and I want to do like a brief review of what we went through last, last week before we start this week. If you recall, what were the two really major themes of the first half, well, approximately, the first half of chapter 13? If you recall? Uh, the worship of Jesus. Right? And that happened when? During the Last Supper, right? Mm -hmm. And we talked about the significance of that and what that really meant, right? We, and, and we kind of looked at it, and we looked at it in depth because... We talked about it was very highly unusual that they started the Last Supper. They started this supper, and right in the middle of it, he stops, Jesus stops, takes off his garments, and starts wanting to wash his yeah. disciples' feet. And we said why that was so unusual is normal customs in that culture was when somebody got invited to a home, they come in and got ready to eat, number one, they needed their feet washed because it was dirt roads. All right, and they run around sandals with no socks, so you can imagine how dirty their feet would be. But the way it normally always worked, they would come into the home, and number one, the lowliest slave of the household would wash the person's feet, and number two would wash their feet before the supper ever started. Mm -hmm. But we see in this account when Jesus washes his disciples' feet that they start the supper. And all of a sudden, he stops and starts washing their feet. Mm -hmm. And we're like, what's that all about? But then when you look in, um, when we looked into the, some of the other Gospels, it talked about, we found out that the disciples basically did what? Remember, they broke out into an argument. Mm -hmm. And what were they arguing about? Who was, was going to be the greatest? Yeah. Who's, Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And this isn't the first time they've done this. Yeah. You go through the four Gospels, you see other accounts where they did this. Uh -huh. Who's going to be the greatest? And So why did Jesus, Jesus stop right then when that happened? To do two things. To teach them a lesson that if you want to be great in my kingdom, you need to be what? You need to have a servant's heart. And he basically says, you know, Tony Lane version, I am your master, I am your teacher. You say that I'm the son of God. You say that I'm the son of man. But yet I'm stopping and washing your feet. And you are my disciples. Disciples are not greater than the master, yet I'm serving you. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? You've got to have a servant's heart. So he used that particular time to show them a lesson because of what happened. The argument they broke out into. We also talked about it had dual meanings. What was the other meaning? We talked about it was spiritual principle. Remember, he was, he was talking about when Peter, after he said, Well, you can't wash my feet, Lord, because you know you're, you're up here and I'm down here. And and Jesus said, Remember, he said, if unless you will let me wash your feet, you have no part of me. Right. And in typical Peter fashion, what did he wash say? Wash the whole thing then, Lord. <laughs> wash everything. Yeah. You know, okay, <laughs> if you want, that's the case. But like, then Jesus said something very peculiar. He basically said, you've already had a bath, your head, you're clean, but you still need to be cleansed here. Yeah. And we talked about how because of the relationship with Jesus Christ, okay, but yet we think about it, they weren't spiritually clean yet, guys. No. They weren't. They don't become spiritually clean, uh, clean until after he does what? Those got to, yeah, and he's got to die on a cross for the yeah. sins, right? Yeah. He hasn't been crucified yet. So it was impossible for anybody to truly be spiritually clean. Right. 
But see, that was a symbol of what he was getting ready to do. And like Lord Lee said, the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. Right. Holy Spirit is the one that cleanses us from the inside out. Amen? Amen? He does. Well, think about it. At this particular time, they had trust in who Jesus was. They were going everywhere he was. They were seeing the miracles. They were believing on the evidence of what they've seen, what they heard him say. But they had no Holy Spirit living in them yet. Right. And a matter of fact, they don't have the Holy Spirit. We find out after Jesus rises again from the grave and he comes to them and he breathes in them. Remember? He says, receive the Holy Spirit. That was when they were born again. Right then. Right then. And then they didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit until what? He ascended 40 days later into heaven back at the right hand of the Father, and He told them, go to Jerusalem and wait until power comes upon you. I will send the gift that I've been promising. Mm -hmm. So about the Holy Spirit. Yes. That's when they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's when they were empowered. That's where they went from huddling, all afraid in a room, worrying about the Romans and the Pharisees and everybody killing them, to they got bold and they started going out and they started doing the thing that Jesus did. That's also when they realized all this. Stuff that yes. Them yes. Like exactly. Because all, all the things they didn't understand, didn't right? Understand. Yeah. Just like right now, I guarantee you, and the reason I guarantee you is I can prove it from God's word. If somebody who's unsaved reads the word of God, it makes zero sense. Amen. It does. It makes zero sense. I know that from God's word, and I know that because of me. <laughs> I've read the word of God before I was saved, and I'm like, this is. First of all, but it's a hooey. Yeah. And second of all, this none of this makes any sense. But you know as well as I do what happens once you truly get saved. The Holy Spirit comes in you. You're born again. The Spirit starts making it come alive. And think about it. It only makes sense who inspired the men of the Bible to write the Word of God. The Holy Spirit. So you got that same Holy Spirit living in you once you're saved. And it it just starts coming alive. And that's why you're right, sister. That's why Jesus said many times, you don't understand now, but you will. You don't understand now, but you will. Because he knew the Holy Spirit was coming. See? So, yeah. So, we looked at all that, and all that was like the day, the night before he was getting ready to go to the cross. Okay? And the Gospel of John itself doesn't focus too much time on the Last Supper. If you really want to dig into the Last Supper, you need to read the other Gospels. It focused more on this teaching about the foot washing and all that. But if you remember, we went and looked at it where it talked about the Last Supper. It talked about the covenant of the, the new covenant of the blood and the bread and all that. But he, John wanted to focus on, think about this, every single time Jesus did anything in the four Gospels. And, and, and I challenge you to do this when you read through any of the Gospels. Every time he does something, he does it for a reason. Mm -hmm. Every single time. Yep. And a lot of times, you really better dig into it because it's usually two reasons. Usually there's some physical reason and then there's some spiritual reason behind it. Mm -hmm. God, you know, like God does nothing in vain. There's a reason He's always got a plan. He's always got a reason. It's always leading to something, just like he did with these disciples when he washed his feet, washed their feet. So that kind of gets us back up to where we left off last week. Is there any questions or comments before we start tonight? Yeah. Yeah, Pastor Tony, I've, I've taught about this uh, with Judas, mm -hmm. and that shows what, to me, correct me if I'm wrong, complete humility for Jesus, the Son of God, God Himself, to wash Judas's feet. The one that's going to betray him. The one that's going to betray him. Yeah. It's like He's given him, if I'm saying this right, given him a chance to repent. To repent. Yeah. And we're going to see where He gives him another chance a little later. But you're exactly right, brother. You got to remember, He's God. Just like Jerry's talking about, yeah. He knew that Judas was going to betray him. Yeah. Yet. He treated him the same way as the other disciples when he watched his feet. That's what's so mind-boggling. Very good point. Very good point. And we're going to see a little bit later in this chapter, he gives them 
another chance to repent because of the love he has for him. But then we see the reaction of Judas. We all know the story. We all know what, what happens. But yeah, very good point. Anybody else got anything they want to add or say before we go on tonight? Okay, so with all that said, we are in verse 18. But actually, I want to do something. Do you guys recall last week when we got on the topic, when we were going through the first half of this chapter, we got on the topic how we were talking about Jesus and the Father of one and all that. And I remember I even told you, I said, I can't remember for sure where it's at. And I just paraphrased. I said, there's a verse in the Bible that Jesus is praying to the Father. And he says, the name that you give me, the name that was your name. Remember when I said that to you guys? And I said, I'll try to find the Bible verse. Well, I found it. So I'm going to read it to you. And by the way, uh, it's in John. We just, we just hadn't got there yet. It's in John chapter 17, and it's verses 10 through 11. Now, I want you to really intently listen to the way this is, the way this is worded. <clears throat> so he's praying to the Father. Jesus is praying to the Father for his disciples. Okay? So these are all Jesus' words. He says to the Father, he says, All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. He's talking to the Father. And glory, glory has come to me through them. Who's the them? It's to his disciples. Because the Father said, I give them unto you because of the work that you're going to do. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. He's going to send back into heaven, right? Now listen to this. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. The power of your name. Did you catch that? The power of your name. In other words, Jesus is saying, Father's name was Jesus the Father gave it to the Son and named Him Jesus. Do you guys see that? The power of your name. Who's the your that He's speaking of? The Father. The power of your name. If there's not one place in the Bible that completely shows that Jesus Christ and the Father are one and the same, that three persons, one God, but so much so, they are so much one, exact identity, exact character, exact nature, that the very name of Father God was Jesus Christ and He gave it to the Son. When He told the Virgin Mary that you will name Him Jesus, that was the Father's name. Try to wrap your mind around that. I don't know, but it boggles my mind. But there's only one way to interpret that verse. And I've talked to many pastors about it. They said, yeah, that's what it says. That's what it says. And I just, I just find that fascinating when I read that. Amen? Amen. I promise you I'd find that verse, so I wanted to read it to you. You just wait another week and you got it. No, no it'll be a couple, three weeks. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start at 18. And remember, he just got through telling them that Jesus tells his disciples that one of them is going to betray him. He's already mentioned that, and he doesn't say who. No. And then he says, then he says something interesting that we're not going to read in this tonight because we looked at it last week, but he basically says, go along with the teaching, and I'm just paraphrasing, you will be fine. Do these things. I'm the light of the world. I'm going to be leaving, but if you follow, if I, you know, you follow my teachings, you will be fine. And then he says this, though, verse 18, I'm not referring to all of you, in other words, he's saying Judas isn't going to be fine. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill the scripture. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. So when he says I'm not referring to all of you, who's the one that he's not referring to? Judas. Judas. Because Jesus Christ knows that Judas is going to betray him. Even though none of the disciples do, Jesus does. Judas does. Yeah. What do you but, suppose would have happened to Judas if they had known him? Do you think they would have maybe killed him? I don't know. I mean, that's speculation. I, 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 yeah, don't, I, just, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. 
But it's going to be amazing that we're going to find out that Jesus gives him multiple chances to repent. Mm -hmm. He really, really does. Now, do you see here where it says, but this is to fulfill the scripture? He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel again you know, against me. So in other words, Jesus is saying, Scripture's already spoke of this. And Judas is doing what the Scripture spoke about. Jesus is referring to the book of Psalms. I'm going to read this to you. Verse 41. How come Judas didn't read the book of Psalms? How come he didn't? Yeah. <laughs> and I want to see if this sounds like anything that we just are, are talking about here. He says, even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. See, Jesus is going to. Jesus is doing what right now? They're eating. They're doing the Last Supper. Yeah. They're breaking bad bread together. But they don't he's, know it's the Last Supper. No, at that time they don't. But they're breaking bread together, and what he says here is, Judas is going to turn against me. And it's fulfilling what Scripture talked about in Psalms. Then verse 19, it says, I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am He. In other words, what he's saying here is, you guys don't have a clue who it is. I know who it is. And I'm telling you, because what? To keep continually show you, I am who I said I am. Yeah. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. I am the Son of Man. All the things I've professed, I am He. And also, to let Judas know. But it didn't faith you. No, but see, this is one of the chances right here for Judas to start thinking about it, trying to soften his heart. He's telling him, I'm doing this so you believe in who I truly am. Because mm -hmm. maybe Judas had still had a doubt. Well, think about it. After he exposes Judas, do you think Judas had a doubt of who he was then? I don't know how he could have. But we're going to see that he still didn't repent. Verse 20 says, I tell you the truth, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. You know what that really means? He's telling his disciples that, but you know he's telling us, us that too. When we do go out to do things for God and we witness for God and we're witnessing for Jesus and they accept us, they're accepting Jesus Christ. If they accept the word that we're sharing with them, they're accepting Jesus Christ. If they deny that word and deny us, you know who they're denying? Jesus Christ. Does this sound like a, a familiar story? Let me read to you. It's the same kind of concept. Out of Matthew, I should have charged my light before I started tonight. It's almost dead. Stick your finger in the socket. Yeah. <laughs> it's in Matthew, and it's verse 25, or excuse me, chapter 25, verses 35 through 40. I want to read to you this. This is going to be a, a familiar story, but I want to read this to you. And just and think of the context, what he's talking about this here. It says, for I, was hung, for I was hungry, this is Jesus speaking, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I, I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him. Who's the righteous? That's us. We're the righteous. Why are we righteous? Because we've accepted Jesus Christ and His righteousness is imputed to us. He's talking to believers right here. You're the righteous. That's us. Them and us. He says, then the righteous will answer Him. This is what they're going to say. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needed clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? And this is his response. The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. 
You see what that says? Do you understand the, the, the huge meaning behind that? Every time we do something for Jesus Christ, I want you guys to really hear this. Every time we do something for Jesus Christ, Jesus says that's like doing it for Him. Mm. That's doing it for Him. And that's why He said in John, the verse we read, that if anyone accepts you, they accept Me. If anyone denies you, they deny Me. Right. Never underestimate what you do for the Lord. Because what he's saying here, what you do for the least of them is like doing it for me. Somebody needs help getting across the street. I'm just going to say some goofy little thing. Somebody needs help getting across the street and the Lord lays it on your heart to go help this person cross the street and we think it's no big deal. You know what Jesus says? That's like you did it unto me. Because you did it with my heart, my love. My grace, my mercy, that was your motivation behind it. And that's the point he's trying to make here. If you do it with my heart for me, it's like you did it for me. Isn't that amazing? I don't know about you guys, but that encourages me. That encourages me that I don't care how small it is, how little it is, you give somebody a ride, you do whatever. You know what? Jesus says... You did that for me. And there's some people in here that need to hear that. You fixed dinner for somebody because of the love you have for Jesus Christ for a fellow Christian. You did that for me, Jesus says. You see what I'm saying? You see how important this is? You see why we need to be on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ and let the love of Him flow through us and touch people? Because every time we do that, you know what Jesus says? You did that for me. And when we go to heaven, you've heard me say very many times about the judgment seat of Christ and the rewards that are going to be given. It's going to be given for things like that. Jesus is going to say, you see, you did that unto me. You did that for me. Because think about it. He dies on the cross for everyone's sin. He wants all people to be saved. Forty days later, he ascends into the heaven, into heaven and he gives the Holy Spirit. Why? To do His work through His children. He's not here right now on this earth, but He's doing it through us. We are His arms, we are His legs, we are His feet, we are His heart. We are the body of Christ. Amen? We are. So we need to really, I believe, get excited and never downplay the things we do. Oh, I come clean to church uh, you know, after everybody's gone and... The lights are up and it's no big deal. Yes, it is. You're doing it unto the Lord because you love the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you know what Jesus said? You did that unto me. Right. See what I'm saying? Nothing too big, nothing too small. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, wow. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to go to verse 21. And I want to try to get down a little bit early so we can have a little bit of ice cream cake fellowship. I'm <laughs> not going to get near as far as I thought I would tonight, but that's fine. We had some wonderful things. Uh, we, had, we, we had a healing prayer going on. We had some other things. And I'm just fine. God's God and He's going to move. And I'm just step out of the way and let Him do what He wants to do. Amen. Verse 21. I want to read this verse. I'll a couple more verses and then we'll stop. So he's got just got through saying, anybody that accepts me accepts you, and, and that whole thing that we talked about. And then he said, verse 21, after he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. We know it's Judas Iscariot, right? We know it's Judas Iscariot. That's a teaser. I'm going to leave off right there. Because that's a terrible place to leave off. Does that make you guys want to come back next week? That's a terrible place to leave off. I should have left off verse 20 because this is starting the new thought that the rest of the chapter is about. But just like Brother Jerry said when he washed Jesus' feet, you're going to see other instances where Jesus gives Judas a chance to repent and turn back. And he still does. The very end, he loved Judas. He loved Judas as much as he did the other disciples. Yes. He walked with Judas for three years in his ministry. So, because of the loving grace of Jesus Christ, he never gives up on somebody. Amen? Amen.
So I'm going to go off and go ahead and leave off there. Does anybody have any questions or comments or things they want to say before I pray and let you guys go chow down on some ice cream and cookies and cupcakes? <laughs> no? Okay. I want to leave you with this thought. And I know I already said it once. I think it'll really shape our actions if we truly understand how important it is for Jesus when we do things for Him. And don't just think about big things. Don't think, well, oh, I got to get behind the pulpit. Or I got to. You know what? The Lord doesn't call everybody to do the same thing. That's why the whole, we got a chapter and a half that talks about the body of Christ, the eye, all the different parts of the body. It takes all the parts of the body working together to have a healthy body. So what can happen? Jesus Christ can be glorified and the kingdom of God can be grown and grown and grown. So every time you think you're not making a difference, understand, Jesus says, you did that for me. Amen? Would pray. Father, I thank you so much. I thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you've preserved this through the ages, Lord, so we can look at it, Lord, and we can be blessed by it. Lord, I just pray through the presence of your Holy Spirit that you explode these truths in our hearts more and more, and we just understand, and we just understand how much you love us and how much you want us to go through this life and experience you each and every day and bless other people. We thank you for that. Lord, I just pray for protection for each person in here and just to watch over them in a mighty way. In the name of above all names, I pray. Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys.